All right, so we're going to continue with um, working on assignment 202 as part of your exercise uh, 212. And as I said last class, I'm going to end up repeating myself for three days in a row, starting from the beginning. But I think it's a healthy thing for you to see me do it over and over again. Um, it is something that I think is very, very important that you learn in the process. And therefore, it's worth going over several times. Today, we'll get a little bit more in depth about how we go about choosing what our contours are. They won't be arbitrary anymore. But I will go all the way back to the very start, and then we'll work through it, and you'll see what I'll add on to it um, in the process. So I'm going to use the same SketchUp file that I did last class, but for review purposes. If I open up SketchUp, and in SketchUp, I want to find a geolocation. So I'll go to the File menu, and I will go to Geolocation, Add Location. And then it's a matter of finding the, the specific location. Once I've found that, I'll go to File, Save As, and make sure to pick a SketchUp 2013. I know that's compatible. One of the newer versions may be compatible, but I'm not sure. I know, I'm sure 2013 is compatible, so I picked 2013. And I'll save that file. At that point, it's a matter of bringing it into Rhino. And so I have a brand new Rhino document. I'm going to bring that same Hawaii um, sample file in. Maybe with all the rain, I'm just wishing that I was there <laughs> instead of being here. That, that might have something to do with it. But I'm going to go to File, and I'm going to go to Import. Remember, it's not insert, it's import, because I want to bring the whole file in. And I have it listed here as Hawaii Topography. I'll go ahead and click on Open. It will bring up the SketchUp import options. The default options are just fine. And we'll go ahead and say OK. When I bring it in, if I switch my view into shaded mode, we can see that it brings in two things. One is a mesh surface, and the other is a flat plane. SketchUp makes both as objects and allows you to toggle between the two. So you could be working on a flat object instead of uh, the terrain. We can go ahead and safely get rid of that flat object because it's not going to do anything for us right now. So I'll get rid of that. And then I want to take a look at my layers. And all too often, you guys skip over the layer part. And that's fine right now. You can survive with fewer layers. I'm warning you right now that it will start to really haunt you if you don't deal with your layers early in the design process. So I'm going to deal with my layers early. The only layer that really matters is layer 0. I'll rename that layer to be SketchUp Mesh or SketchUp Terrain or something like that, something that's meaningful. And then I'm going to get rid of the other layers. So we'll get rid of that, and we'll get rid of all these layers. And now I have Default, and I have SketchUp Mesh. Let's rename Default to be Contours X. And so that's Contours X. Let's go ahead and create another layer for Contours Y. Y. OK, so now I need to convert this um, shape into a workable, usable mesh. I'm going to use the Curve Network or the Network Surface command to create that uh, workable NURB surface um, from, this, from this mesh. I did actually, you know, I post all the lectures online. Um, and I had a comment from one of the, the YouTube people that were out there saying, why don't you just do a patch command of the, of the mesh, or create a bunch of points on the mesh and do a patch command. And technically speaking, that does almost the same thing. Uh, the difference is in, uh, I'll do it just for example here. If I take, it's obviously easier. I'm doing 100 by 100, and we'll say OK. There's fewer steps involved in doing this, but I want to show you what happens and why it doesn't work uh, as well. It's, it's an acceptable method, but it's not quite as good. So ho hold on for just a second. All right, so it made a surface. And as we look at it, in the center of the surface, it's about as accurate as the surface that we first created using the network surface command. Where it breaks apart, though, is on the edges. And we have a tendency to lose the accuracy along the edges here because it creates all of this extra surface off the edge. 
So if we were going to do something like that, we'd need to trim off all that extra. So if I were doing it, I would probably duplicate the edges, project them onto this surface, and get rid of the excess. But it's close, and it's certainly a little bit easier. Um, so you know, based on that comment, I wanted to at least acknowledge that this, there is always more than one way of doing it. Um, the part that I don't like is what happens on the edges. Uh, and if you don't trim it off, so for example, let's, let's focus in on this edge for, for a second here. Okay, if we look at this edge, there's a valley, and the patch then makes the valley flat and ends up at a flat edge here. Well, in reality, in the terrain, it doesn't go from this valley to being flat up here. That's not what the actual terrain is. So everything beyond the, the mesh that we created it from is distorted reality. It's not really there. So the only accurate way of doing it would be to trim this off. Uh, and let me, I can show you this. So we could look at it in the top view. We could create like a rectangle that was smaller than my object. We'll call it something like that. I could take this, oops, this curve that I just did. Notice it's distinctly smaller than that. I could take this curve. I could project it onto this surface. I could then trim that piece off. And that's not bad as an end result in terms of a different method of doing it because that valley no longer appears like it gets smaller. So as long as you do that trim, it's reasonable. And then you could work with it the same way, rebuild it the same way. Note that there things like this do happen. See how we can see it in cross-section now. There's a much bigger gap between this and the angle of that. So there's differences, but you get those similar differences using the curved network. Anyway, all of that was, was extra information. So we'll come back here, and I'm going to do the curve network both ways to show you that way. right? So I'm going to do a uh, contour. I would also add, and I added this in the comments, that you learning and using the contour command is more flexible long term. The patch doesn't always work. It doesn't always get you what you want. The, the, just like when we did the cushions with the curve networks, the curve network will get you a precise surface through those particular curves. So the end results are a little better. So in terms of skills, I would rather have you that have that skill. Anyway, so we're going to contour this mesh. I am on the contours X layer. I'll hit Enter. I have Knot and Vertex turned on in my object snaps. I'll start right here at that vertex. And I'm going to go off in the X direction right there. My distance between the contours is still at, set at 100 feet. I'll hit Enter, and it then contours my shape. I'll then go back to this, right click to repeat the last command. We'll go from that corner, go off in the Y direction. Oh, I should have put it on the Y, sorry. Try that one more time. Contour or curve, curve from objects, contour. There's my vertex. We're going to go off in space there at 100 feet. And I now have the contours in both the x and the y direction. Let's turn off the SketchUp mesh now. And so now we can see the mesh that was created. I will jump back into my top view to trim off the excess parts. So let's use this and that and that that and we'll go ahead and trim there we go and again having the nice even border around the outside is essential to do the curve network so now I have the contours in the X and the contours in the Y with no ragged edges at all now I'll go ahead and do my curve network from this. Before I do the curve network, it's always a good idea to save. So do a file, save as, or file save. And this would be exercise 212. I'll go ahead and click Save. And now I'll go ahead and do the curve network. So I'll select my curves. I'll go up to Surface, Curve Network. Remember, if you're typing in the command, it's Network Surface instead of Curve Network. Why it's different, I don't know. Assuming we did it correctly, we should get A, B, C, and D. 
on the four sides, which we do, and we'll go ahead and say OK. And remember, this part takes a little bit of time for it to calculate. Just like I did when I did the patch, it still took time to calculate. So it's always going to, because it's a complicated surface, going to take a little bit of time. All right, so it finished. And remember when it finishes, it slows down Rhino a lot. And that is because the resulting surface is extraordinarily accurate, but it's almost too accurate. So I'm going to click off so that nothing's selected. I'll click on my surface, and we get the big yellow block. I'll then go into Rebuild. And as I said before, a U and V of 100 by 100 is, is appropriate. You could, of course, go higher than this. We could go 200 by 200, but we're going to reflect more of the triangulated surface than is really necessary. So there I am. Notice that my resulting surface is exactly on the borders. I didn't have to do any project or trims or anything. It's exactly what I wanted. And it is very, very accurate to the original surface. There are, of course, a few pieces, if I were to turn on the SketchUp mesh, that are slightly off as part of it. But for the most part, it's very, very close. I can also choose, if I want to, to rebuild the surface again and make it a little bit smoother. So I could take this and I could rebuild it, say, 50 by 50, and say OK, and it would get a little bit smoother. The degree to which you rebuild is entirely up to you and what feels right as part of your, your terrain. So now that I have that, we'll go ahead and take my surface and I'm going to move it onto a new layer called uh, topography. And so we will change object layer. And with that as my current layer, I'll turn off x and y. And now all I have is just the terrain itself. So that was essentially what we did last class. And you can see that I breezed through that. And now we'll concentrate on what we're trying to learn today. Uh, and that's, that's how do we make this into a physical model. And so now that we have a nice nerve surface to work from, we have to start thinking of this in terms of how, do, how are we going to cut it out. And as soon as we start thinking of how we're going to cut it out, we have some questions. Number one, what material are we going to make the model out of becomes critical, because if we're going to make the model, we have to know that. And number two, what scale are we going to make the model in? Both of those things need to be resolved before we can make a physical model. So to some extent, we could reverse engineer what those two are. Say we want the final model to be 11 by 17. If it's 11 by 17, which happens to be the size of the final model you're going to make, we could pick a scale that would make our terrain fit on 11 by 17. That would be one way of doing it. Uh, the other way of doing it would be that your instructor or your professor says, here's your site. I want you to do a site model at 1 to 200, or 1 to 100, or 16th inch, or whatever it is. And so sometimes it will be dictated to you. So it depends what you're making as to what size it'll end up being. And in the case of, of this class, I'm picking 11 by 17 because it fits really conveniently on the laser cutter. If you're, if you're doing it for a, a particular site for your, your 220 project or something, it's going to be based on the site and the scale that's required, not based on the size of the laser cutter. So you might have to glue pieces together, and, and it might be a little bit more complicated. But for now, we're going to stick with Oh, it's 11 by 17. So um, you'll see that I have this chart on the bottom of your little handout. The chart exists on this handout. It exists on the website. It exists in your book uh, if you bought it. It is a reference that I created for you to be able to figure this stuff out. So if, you know what, let me bring it up here. so that I can highlight it while we're doing this here. Uh, let's see. All right, so there we go. So as I'm talking about, instead of pointing to the paper version, I'll point to this. So we have some different things that are happening here. Um, I have right here under paper size 11 by 17. I, I gave you 11 by 17 because that's the size that we're going to do of the model. 
The laser bed here is 12 by 24, but our paper size is 11 by 17. So it's these two columns. On the first two columns, this is a set of scales. So if you were told you want a model at 1 to 200, for example, the 11 by 17 model would be 2,200 feet by 3,400 feet in real scale. So it's just a math equation. I just did the math for you. It makes life a little easier for you to figure it out. If we get down here into some of the other uh, you know, more, more complicated scales, 16th inch equals a foot, for example, we would come over here. 11 by 17 is only 176 feet by 272 feet. So you can see that I ordered these from largest scale to smallest scale as we go forward. So if your instructor said, oh, I want a model at you know, 1 to 25, you could look it up and see what the 11 by 17 size would give you. Here, does that make sense for how this all works? Then we move into this second half over here that says construction material thickness. So this is where I told you we need to know what we're going to build our topography out of to begin with. And so in the case of you guys, I would highly recommend you use the basic cardboard that's available at the bookstore. It works nice for a model. It's cheap. It's brown. Life is good. Okay. If we're doing that and we were to measure it, a lot of people would say, oh, it's an eighth of an inch thick. Well, it's really close to an eighth of an inch thick, but it's a little bit over. Furthermore, when you glue your model together, there's a little bit of glue that goes in between the two pieces. It's almost impossible to get it exactly together. So when in doubt, round up a little bit. So in this case, the bookstore cardboard is 5 seconds of an inch thick. So we're going to look at the 5 seconds column and ignore all these other columns for right now. At this, if, let's say, I was back on the 1 to 200 scale model, remember my paper size would be 2,200 feet by 3,400 feet. If I continue to come over here, my 5 seconds inch thick cardboard that I'm going to make my model out of, one of those contours is 31.25 <coughs> feet. So I'm doing the math all the way through, translating what my physical material is that I'm going to make it out of to what the actual contour step needs to be in the z direction. So when I cut up my model, I know how, how at each contour interval, and this will start to make sense as it comes together, at each contour interval, what it should be to represent the material. Okay? If I had thicker material, for example, let's say I had half inch material, my, at half inch material, I would have a contour at every 100 feet because it's a half inch thick. So I'd need 100 feet to represent that half inch. So we're going to work with the 530 seconds, and we're going to work with the 31.250 feet. The alternative would be one of the other scales, which you can see what they all are right here. I'm going to stick with that 1 to 200. So first thing I need, and I'll come back to this a few times, is my 11 by 17 size, which is 2,200 by 3,400 feet. Recognize these are all in feet. Okay, 2,200, 3,400. So I'm going to come back to my Rhino model. I'm going to look at the top view, and I'm going to draw a rectangle that is at 3,400 feet, 2,200 feet, enter. So there's a rectangle that is the size of the model I'm going to create. And I'm going to slide that, using the move command, over my topography. If your rectangle is too large, change scales and do one that's smaller. Right? If I were to come back here and I drop the scale to 1 to 100, for example, I'd be at 1,100 by 1,700. And so my rectangle would be at 1,700 feet, comma 1,100 feet. That would be my size. So you see how it relates to the final model that I'm going to make. So I picked 1 to 200 because I happened to know that it fit really close to what the, the, the actual terrain that I had taken. You will find, depending uh, on your, on your uh, model, that there will be more, you know, you'll, you'll have to vary it a little bit. Just because I picked 1 to 200 doesn't mean you have to pick 1 to 200. If you, when you grabbed your terrain, if it was limited to the square, the biggest that um, SketchUp would let you take, 
chances are you're going to be in the 1 to 500 scale up here. But again, it's up to you. So I'm not dictating that it needs to be a specific scale. You're going to pick what scale is appropriate for you. So let me go back to Rhino. There is my rectangle. If I were to look at it in the perspective view, we could see what part of the terrain is being included as part of this piece. So this valley is kind of fun. It would be a little bit more work to make, but it's kind of fun. So I maybe want to move this over a little bit to include the valley, something like that. And then we'll include those pieces there. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So this is a little bit more challenging. If I moved it to the opposite end, if I moved it over here, it would be a little bit less challenging because the terrain isn't so different. Do you guys see how that works? The steeper the terrain, the harder the model is to make. If you picked an extraordinarily steep site and your steps start to get too close together, you might want to pick a different site, make it, make it a little bit easier to build it. If you have a lot of experience making models, you like making models, you're good at it, do something a little harder. Right? The, the really steep ones turn out really cool, but it's a lot more work. So it's, it's, a, it's a trade off. OK, so there I am. I've, I've established where that rectangle is going to be. Now I need to project this rectangle onto this surface. So I'm going to go ahead and type project. I'm going to project that rectangle, enter, onto that surface, enter. And when I do that, we can see then the size of my final model. So there it is. And I'll go ahead and I'll trim off the excess of this terrain. The other option would be to split it so that you could have your old terrain if you needed it. For me, I'm just going to go ahead and trim it. So we'll go ahead and trim off that piece. And we're down to just my 11 by 17 model in its appropriate scale. OK, so now that I have that set up, and again, those are all on the topography layer, I'm going to create a new layer. And this time, I'll call it um, Contours Z, because they're going on the up direction. You could call it topo lines, whatever, whatever you want. And I'm now going to contour this terrain with a contour interval that matches my scale. So I was at 1 to 200. My material thickness is 530 seconds. Therefore, my contour interval is 31.250 feet. Remember, it's in feet. So I'll go back to my curve, curve from objects, contour. Oh, wait, let me make sure I'm on contour Z. There we go. Curve, curve from objects, contour. I'm going to contour this object. I'll pick a corner to start. Remember that the contour needs to go up in the z direction. So I may need to do that in one of the side views. So we're going straight up. There it is, straight up. And my interval is 31.250 feet. Enter. So it just contoured what my terrain looks like here. And if we look at it there, each one of these steps represents one piece of cardboard in the final model. So don't panic, though, because that we're going to make it so that it's hollow. It's not going to be a solid sheet. You know, It's not going to be a big brick of cardboard. That would just take too much cardboard. It would be too expensive. So now we need to start creating the sides to this model. And if we were just to glue this, you know, if we were to cut it out and glue it on top of each other, it would make a nice model. But we wouldn't have any way of supporting it. And it would get kind of floppy, and it wouldn't really be accurate. So we're going to go ahead and build the sides. And in the beginning, you guys, this is going to be daunting. It's like, oh, man, it's so hard to create these sides and all the steps, and it's just so much work. When you guys get proficient in Rhino, this is something you can whip out in 30 minutes. And you have a perfect terrain model of exactly what you're going to do. I promise you, when you move on to Berkeley and Cal Poly, you won't get flat sites anymore. There will always be topography. And to be able to do this and to quickly generate uh, a scratch model that you can work on is critical. You know, you have a laser cutter, you have this, it's really easy. This stuff takes no time at all. You can produce a bunch of them. So I have all of those contours established, and I now need to draw little steps between each of these sides. 
So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn off the topography itself and have just the lines left. There they all are. And now I need to start to connect the sides together. And so if I start at the lowest point, sometimes that's the easiest way of doing it. And I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this. By the way, this is written out. If you go to under tutorials, if you go to physical modeling, topo method one, it walks through exactly what I'm doing here. So you can go back and, and reference the, the steps. There's also lots and lots of videos. There's even a video of me putting it together, which is actually quite funny. About halfway through, the bottle of glue explodes on me and gets all over everything. Somebody gave me a bad bottle of glue. No, I, it was just it was sitting around, and I picked it up. They're like, oh, you used that bottle. Anyway, it's kind of funny. But it's there. So it, all of this exists. So you guys can see this, see me do this again. But I will do it for you as well. Okay, So there's two different ways to go about doing this. And one of which, to me, is significantly easier, but it's a higher level concept to grasp. The other way involves more steps, but it's easier to do with the skills that you have now. So I'm going to show you both in terms of how you do it. And let's see, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to do this side right here, because it's a shorter side, and it'll be an easier set of steps. So in the first method, what we're going to do is I'm going to come over to my point tool. And when I go over to the point tool, there's two different options. One, if I left click, it'll be a single point. If I right click, it'll be multiple points. I want to right click because I need multiple points. And I'm just going to, let me turn off not and vertex so I have just endpoint on. So I won't get any mistakes here. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to create a point on the end of every one of these little lines. until I get to the end. So I have all those points there. I'll hit Enter to finish. And you can see them all. I didn't do one on this because it's actually on the back side, not on this side. You may find that you have these mistakes that happen. We'll deal with the corners next class. So I have those points set up. Now I need to select those points so I can select them. I don't want these little lines. So let me hold down Control and deselect those lines. And now I'm going to use a Rotate 3D. So I'll go, go up to Transform, Rotate 3D. I'm going to start at the lowest point there. I'm going to go straight off, and in this case it would be the Y axis, straight up and fold those curves flat. And so you see how I took those curves that were those points that were all along the edge, and I folded them right flat so that they'd be laying flat on the ground. Now. I can go through and I'm going to do a new layer for side one. And for so you guys can see it a little better, I'm going to turn it red. Oops, apparently it's side 11. No, side one. That's active. And I'll now draw, using my polyline tool, starting at the first point, a series of steps. So I'll go straight. And I do want to use my smart tracking. That's good. And I need to turn on snapping to points so that I can snap to that point. And I'll pull over, let me turn on perpendicular as well, until I get perpendicular. And I'll start to go, there it is, perpendicular. So again, to point, pull over, like that. And I'll work my way along to create these points. You will encounter some places where something like this happens. See how that those two points are in a straight line? You just want to make sure that you're consistent. So in this case, I've stepped up to that point. I'll go straight across. Now I need to go back down. So I'll go down to there, over and back up to there. And if you mess up on these, I can walk you through it once you have your specific example. It takes a while to see how this is going to work. But you should always do something from point to point. There should always be a step involved. 
Almost there. Now, I promise you that I made this look way easier than it actually is. It will take some practice. So now that I have those points and this selected, I'm going to go rotate 3D, starting with my lowest point, once again, going off in space. And we're going to fold that back up. And you can now see that we created the first set of steps that go up the side. If we want it, we want to make sure, obviously, that it was created correctly. If we look at it in one of the side views, in that case, all the step lines should be perfectly vertical, and all the horizontals should also be perfectly horizontal. It'll be really obvious if they're off. So we made this. It worked out pretty well. So that method involved putting all the dots on the end, the points, rotating them down, drawing my steps, and rotating them back. There's nothing wrong with that as a strategy, but a lot of times it's easier if we could just use the lines themselves to draw our steps. And in order to do that, you guys have experienced this before, if I were to start, say, right here and to try to draw the steps, it wouldn't want to snap. It would want to draw in the normal xy plane. So what we can do instead is we can switch the drawing plane from being flat on the ground to being vertical, and then we can draw along that vertical plane. This is the part that's mentally more challenging to get your head on. And that's just the way it is. But I want to introduce you to this concept because it is a lot faster long term. And so we're going to work with something called the C plane to adjust our drawing plane, what we're drawing in. And to make it so that we can see it a little bit better, I'm going to go into, and it, this is just for your purposes to see it, I'm going to go in to my options here, if I can find it, tools, options. And I'm going to turn on here under my grid. We're going to do, uh, let's do 2,000. And we'll do a minor grid line every 12 inches, major grid line every uh, 10 minor grid lines. That would be a 10-foot grid. And you see that now I have this, this grid that's kind of represented there. This is the plane that I would draw in right now. So if I were to draw something, it would be flat and in that plane. Does that make sense? This C plane is called world top. It's what our, we're, we're defaulting to. I'm going to change the C plane. And I'll do that by clicking on this little triangle, going to set C plane. And instead of world top, I'm going to pick three points. And so I'll move over to the point that I'm going to start on. There it is. And you see how I have a red and a green axis there? It's saying, OK, there's your red and green axes. I've, I want the x, so I'll go in this direction. But instead of going out here to create the flat plane, I want to go vertical in this direction in the front view. And you'll see that my grid shifts from being flat on the ground to being up vertical. You guys see how that works? So now if I were to draw, I could start here, start right there, and I could draw as if it was flat on the ground right along that would go there, and then this would go back down right along the front of my feet. Just as easy as I drew it when it was laying flat. The difference is I didn't do any rotate 3Ds. I'm just drawing on the object itself. I'm going to hit Enter to finish for, for the time being. When I'm done, or if something goes wrong, click on this little triangle, go to Set C Plane, and go back to World Top. That resets it all to the start. So if something went wrong, world top. Furthermore, if I were to switch sides, I would always reset to world top first and then go back and do the three points. So one more time on this side, just for illustration purposes, I'll go back to set C plane. I'm going to go to three points. I'll start right here at that point. This time, my x is going to go here. But again, I want my y to go straight up. So we'll jump into the side view and make sure it's going straight up. And there it is in that plane. And now I could go ahead and start down here at the bottom. 
probably that one. And that first one is off because that this is part of the side, not the front. So let me start at that point. And now I can draw my way right up the side here. So it's the same strategy as the rotation. The only difference is that I don't have to do any rotation. I'm just drawing on the object itself. So what I want you to do for today is I want you to pick your terrain. I want you to go through and create the nerve surface for your terrain. Figure out what the 11 by 17 size would be at, at a particular scale. Draw it and then project it onto your surface. Once you've done that, projected it onto your surface, you're going to trim off what you don't need. Ah, hold on, I have to draw this one. It's going to go down by 30, 31.250 feet. There we go. Straight down. And then I want you to cut your contours based on your finish there. I want you to cut your contours based on that, that, uh, that contour interval from your material, the 5 30 seconds of an inch, at your particular scale. And I want you to draw the step sides as far as you can get. So in my case, I would do all four sides. If you get to the point where you have all four sides done, don't worry about the corners and how they connect. We're going to talk about the corners specifically next class. Furthermore, we're going to talk about how do we get it flat and folded out so we can go laser cut it and create the laser cut file. So we're building on each, each class day. So this is as far as I want you to get today. I want you to try to work through these sides. If you can, I would encourage you to try out the C-plane method and see if it can make some sense. Because being able to switch the C-plane will help you down the road. Because you'll be trying to draw something on a wall, and it would be a whole lot easier if you just switched the C-plane to be on the wall, and then you drew right on the wall rather than doing the rotations and, and that sort of thing. Um, but again, it's an advanced concept, so it'll take some time to get used to it mentally. If you've worked in AutoCAD and you've worked with UCS coordinates in AutoCAD, then this starts to make sense already. Are there any questions? I know it's a lot to take in. But trust me, you guys are making great headway. You're doing really well, and I'm happy. So I'll turn you loose. If you have questions, let me know, and we'll sit and go through it.